All right, our next session, our second session of the day, is for those who've been newly diagnosed. Our presenter is Dr. Praveen Kamani. Dr. Kamani is at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute of Movement Disorder Center in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Kamani sees a variety of movement disorder patients throughout the year and has a special interest in those who live with ataxia. Dr. Kamani, take it away. Hi folks. Um... Thank you for, uh, for coming together to talk about newly diagnosed ataxia. Uh, my gratitude to National Ataxia Foundation and its stellar team, and all of you and your family members for taking the time out for this presentation. The objectives of today's talk are to briefly talk about the symptoms of cerebellar ataxia, discuss uh, the diagnosis and causes of ataxia. Uh, this is going to be just a very brief overview, and then we'll jump right into multidisciplinary treatment um, and the importance of research in cerebellar ataxia. Cerebellar ataxia is a collection of symptoms due to the progressive deterioration of the cerebellum and its connections. Uh, this slide shows a sideward view of um, a person's brain uh, seen through a magnetic resonance image, MRI, and the arrow points to the part of the brain called the cerebellum. Uh, this portion over here is critical uh, for coordination, for maintaining balance uh, through its connections with other areas of the brain. And in this person's case, this cerebellar area is shrunk due to ataxia. And this is one of the most common things we see when we order neuroimaging or MRI uh, of the brains of people with cerebellar, progressive cerebellar ataxia. So what are the symptoms of cerebellar ataxia? According to a more recent classification, uh, the cerebellar symptoms can be divided into motor symptoms, vestibular symptoms relating to the inner ear, and cognitive and psychiatric symptoms. The motor symptoms of cerebellar uh, ataxia are widely recognized. They include difficulty with walking. People describe walking as walking like a drunk, poor balance occasionally leading to falls, which is progressive, clumsy hands, for instance, when you reach out, you may knock over a cup or a glass, handwriting may deteriorate, speech may become slurred, muscles may become stiff, and oh, there is an overall slowness in movements due to the impaired balance, and as the disease progresses, swallowing can be impaired as well. The vestibular symptoms overlap with the motor symptoms, um, but they include dizziness and vertigo, which are now recognized as integral to a lot of, lot of cerebellar ataxias. The poor balance in falls is not only from actual deterioration of the cerebellum, but its connection to the vestibular nuclei, uh, parts of the brain that um, enable uh, balance, uh, standing upright, um, uh, moving in space et cetera. Uh, visual impairment in cerebellar ataxia is again due to the um, deterioration of the connections between portions of the cerebellum and muscles of the eye. Um, people can variously describe, describe blurred vision, double vision, um, jumping vision, or oscillopsia. Uh, certain cerebellar ataxias can directly affect the, the retina, uh, and other areas of the eye, including the optic nerves. Uh, in their seminal paper in 1998, Dr. Schmaman and Sherman described first the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome, which is now recognized um, as uh, a, a fundamental symptom of cerebellar ataxia. Uh, this includes emotional problems manifested as mood dysregulation, impulsive behavior, disinhibition, apathy, anger, and irritability, uh, progressive cognitive impairment, including difficulty with planning and sequencing, problems with language, memory, and abstract reasoning. The, there are several other clinical features, but uh, they depend on the type of ataxia. They can include, as I mentioned, ophthalmological or eye-related symptoms, musculoskeletal, or vertebral column related symptoms, neuropathy or a degeneration of nerves that can give rise to numbness and pains, 
some cerebellar ataxias are widespread and they can affect the heart, the pancreas, uh, and cause problems with vital organ functions. And then there are some cerebellar ataxias that cause cancers and also affect the immune system. Uh, not everyone has all clinical features of ataxia at the same time. Um, the, the features of cerebellar ataxia are extremely variable and are, are present at different times um, as the uh, disease progresses. So therefore the neurologist um, or the specialist needs to be aware of the various features in order to treat them and also in order to make the diagnosis of cerebellar ataxia. There are several causes of cerebellar ataxias, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to focus on neurodegenerative ataxias, which are divided into genetic and sporadic ataxias. Neurodegenerative ataxias are, are due to a progressive deterioration of cerebellum and its connections. They cause progressive ataxic symptoms. They predominantly cause neurological symptoms, although they can affect other vital organs, as I mentioned previously. Um, and the, the reason they cause a multitude of neurological symptoms is that they affect the brain and its connections to um, other organs. Breaking down neurodegenerative genetic ataxias into autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, and X-linked ataxias uh, defines the cluster of genetic ataxias. Examples of autosomal dominant ataxias include spinocerebellar ataxia, episodic ataxias, dentato pallido rubra pallido lesion atrophy, or DRPLA, and we are up to 48 ataxias from 1 to 48 currently. The autosomal recessive ataxias were recently reclassified uh, and we have recognized about uh, 59 autosomal recessive cerebellar ataxias, Friedrich's ataxia and ataxia telangiectasia uh, being examples of two very common ataxias. Fragile extremer ataxia syndrome is one of the uh, most common X-linked recessive ataxias. Sporadic ataxias can be broken down into um, a neurodegenerative ataxia called multiple system atrophy of the cerebellar subtype. It does not have a, a clear cut genetic underpinning or a particular gene that causes it. And then there is a cluster of ataxias that goes undiagnosed despite our best efforts to find the cause of ataxias. So the diagnosis of cerebellar ataxia uh, is typically made by a neurologist who has experience with the ataxias, remembering that ataxia is a symptom, the cause of ataxia uh, should be determined or everything needs should be done to determine the cause of ataxia. This is done through a thorough history and examination. Um, if there is a known family history of ataxia in family members, then one can go straight to genetic testing. Um, um, if there is no known family history, the testing may become a little more extensive and exhaustive. And it is also important to remember that just because a family history is not known, it doesn't mean someone cannot have a genetic mutation. So ultimately, if the testing, which is informed by clinical course, is, does not reveal an alternative cause of ataxia, genetic testing is mandatory um, in everyone who, who has a progressive uh, cerebellar ataxia of unknown cause. Despite our best efforts, up to 20% of cerebellar ataxias may not have a known cause after extensive testing. This number has come down significantly over the past couple decades from 60% to 50% to 40 to 20% because we have more tests for diagnosis currently. And I think over time, this number is gonna go down further and we may reclassify these unknown ataxias as genetic, autoimmune, or again, sporadic, which are neurodegenerative ataxias, um, such as uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, which is not a true ataxia, but it can present with cerebellar ataxia, and symptoms of ataxia can persist before other symptoms take over. So whenever there is an unknown or idiopathic ataxia, the neurologist should follow the patient over time to determine if 
there are other symptoms that are emerging over time, which would clue them in as to what kind of ataxia it really is, or whether it is a primary cerebellar ataxia or not. All right, so what is multidisciplinary treatment of the cerebellar ataxia? So this is the meter for presentation over here. It is very important to understand that all ataxias are treatable, period. Uh, there are few cerebellar ataxias that have specific drug treatments, and these are the ones that are linked to metabolic disorders most commonly. Ataxia with vitamin E deficiency, um, uh, coenzyme Q10 deficiency, cerebrotenin xanthomatosis. These are relatively rare autosomal recessive ataxias, but if diagnosed early and if treated early, there is a potential for stopping the progression of these ataxias. Knowing the cause of ataxia obviously informs treatment, and the treatment should be tailored to an individual's needs. A multidisciplinary team approach is mandatory uh, for treatment of symptoms of ataxia. So very briefly, um, we talked about specific treatment for ataxias that cause a defici deficiency of vital chemicals, including vitamin E, et cetera. And then there are several off-label drugs that are not approved by FDA to treat ataxia and its symptoms. Riluzole is one for aminopyridine. These have shown in small studies to benefit certain kinds of ataxias. Looking forward, there are numerous drugs that are being researched to slow the progression of cerebellar ataxias. Uh, genetic treatment such as CRISPR-Cas9 and genetic modification of the gene-causing ataxias are being studied. Stem cell treatment is somewhat in its infancy, but it is progressing. And we are probably right now in phase one and phase two trials for stem cell treatment of ataxias. And then there are non-invasive neuromodulation techniques that are being looked at, such as transcranial magnetic stimulation and transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, I'm going to illustrate multidisciplinary treatment through a case study of a 25-year-old man who I saw a few years ago who complained of a mild and progressive gait and balance problems which started in his early 20s, 21 at 20 two years of age. There was no family history of ataxia at all, or at least no known family history of ataxia. He was one of four children. The rest of his siblings were unaffected. Blood tests, spinal fluid testing uh, were normal. The MRI of the spinal cord showed possible um, atrophy or thinning, which clued us into the possible diagnoses. And genetic testing revealed Friedrich's ataxia, and which is characterized by a relatively well-preserved cerebellum, but a spinal cord that can be atrophic. Friedrich's ataxia, in addition to causing cerebellar ataxia, can cause cardiomyopathy or the thickening of uh, the heart and its valves, visual impairment, um, including cataracts, endocrine problems such as diabetes, severe musculoskeletal problems such as scoliosis, um, neuropathy or a degeneration of um, nerves in the hands and feet, a weakness due to um, wasting of muscles, and also cognitive impairment in certain cases. So you see when um, an ataxia affects so many symptoms, uh, so many organs and causes so many symptoms, multidisciplinary treatment is mandatory. Uh, so to treat this gentleman's Friedrich ataxia, I partnered with the cardiologist, uh, the endocrinologist, and his internal medicine doctor. He was seen by an ophthalmologist. Uh, he was enrolled in neurorehabilitation for intensive motor training. Um, he was seen by a genetic counselor before testing and after testing, after the results were available, and also a social worker and mental health uh, counselors to provide support to um, his family. He had uh, three other uh, siblings who were potentially at risk um, for Friedrich's ataxia, which is an autosomal recessive disease. Um, so genetic counseling and mental health counseling was very important for the rest of his family. So 
uh, who are the members of the multidisciplinary team? I jokingly tell my patients that all roads in ataxia lead to the National Ataxia Foundation, which is so true. Uh, they have been a uh, repository of information for such a long time and have been very helpful to my patients and families. They're an integral part of the ataxia community, as are our local ataxia support groups, uh, such as the one here in Western Washington, and um, of course, patients and the caregivers uh, around whom the care should be centered. Um, the National Ataxia uh, uh, Foundation has a lot of fantastic educational information. Uh, we just um, uh, recorded a, a webinar on coronavirus vaccination um, and ataxia, which is, I think, already online. In addition uh, to it, the National Ataxia Foundation um, has a list of uh, neurologists that treat ataxia and ataxia centers where you can get multidisciplinary treatment. The neurologist who diagnoses and treats ataxia ideally orchestrates care, spearheads research, and most importantly, promotes health literacy, not only in the community amongst patients um, and family members, but also amongst newer trainees who are learning to diagnose and treat ataxia. Uh, the clinic staff that the neurologist works with supports patients' needs, helps them navigate the healthcare system, and just magically makes things happen, uh, which is so true of the, of the staff that I work with in my clinic. Genetic counselors are very important when genetic ataxias are being considered. They uh, help with pre-authorization of tests, pre-test counseling, ordering tests, and post-test counseling. And I cannot emphasize uh, that whenever uh, we are thinking of doing genetic testing um, for our patients, it is important that pre-test counseling and post-test counseling be included as part of that workflow. Currently, I am uh, partnering with Variantix and DNA Visit. I think they're two sponsors of the, um, of the meeting here uh, that are providing uh, both pre-test counseling, post-test counseling and also helping me order tests for patients with ataxia. Um, genetic counselors are also very important in education of patients, the family and the team and helping interpret the results when they are not always very straightforward. The internist or the primary care doctor uh, is key to maintaining good general medical health. They partner with the neurologist and also coordinates care with other internal medicine subspecialists such as cardiologists, gastroenterologists, pulmonologist, hematologist, oncologist, and endocrinologist. Not everybody needs all these specialists, but they should be available when the need arises. There are other specialists that the neurologist looks to for assistance with treatment of ataxias as part of the multidisciplinary approach. The phys physical medicine and rehab specialist, the ophthalmologist, urologist, if there is bladder dysfunction, which is very common in ataxias, sleep dysfunction and REM behavior disorder and other sleep disorders are common in the ataxias. So I usually solicit the assistance of a sleep specialist. Otolaryngologists are important in certain ataxias, such as multiple system atrophy, cerebellar subtype that can cause vocal cord paralysis. Psychiatrists and psychologists are critical um, to treating some of the mental health concerns, including assistance with treatment of the cerebellar cognitive of ataxia uh, syndrome in women with ataxia, particularly of childbearing age, or who have ataxias that predispose to gynecological cancers, OBGYN or obstetrics gynecologist specialist who screens them on a regular basis is very important. And we already talked about genetic counseling being critical to the treatment of uh, genetic ataxias. Part of the neurorehabilitation team includes the physical medicine rehab specialist physician. Um, a speech language specialist, physical uh, therapy and occupational therapy. There is mounting evidence that certain kind of intensive motor training, also called extra games, um, are um, really benefit a uh, gait and balance in ataxia. They comprise of uh, physical um, therapy exercises through video games that you can actually do at home, which becomes particularly relevant during COVID times. Uh, these specialists come together to assist patients and families with their equipment needs, implement fall precautions, and also home modifications for um, easy mobility around the home. Um, 
certain patients who have problems with swallowing or who experience significant um, reduced mobility, particularly as the ataxia um, advances, um, benefit significantly from having a palliative care team assist them. And this team, which we're very lucky to have at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute, comprises of social workers, nurse specialists who assist with advanced care plannings, including um, advanced care planning, including advanced directives, patient and family counseling as the disease progresses, implementing home health services, treatment of dysphagia or difficulty, swallowing, and when and if the need arises with hospice care as well. Research, very integral to the treatment of ataxia, includes the patient and family members, very importantly, who partner with the neurologist, the research coordinators, um, uh, uh, very intimately uh, in advancing treatments and cures for ataxia. The National Ataxia Foundation, um, I do believe, is part of a research team because they are, they have a a whole lot of information on ongoing um, research trials. At our institution, um, we are doing the phase three study of proreliazole and certain kinds of spinocerebellar ataxias through Biohaven, which is a research, research sponsor. The National Institute of Health, the National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke are two other national sponsors of ataxia research. And um, there are regular roundtables with other industry sponsors uh, who are interested in developing drugs to slow down, symptomatically treat, or reverse the, the, the progression of ataxias. As of this morning, when I looked at the clinicaltrials.gov website, there are 102 active studies on ataxia nationally and internationally. And I highly recommend people who are newly diagnosed with ataxia to check them out, to partner with your neurologist to determine what's available uh, to you, what interests you, and what's available locally that you can access in terms of research. So um, to sum it up, uh, this is this panel shows um, the various components of the multidisciplinary team. I'm sure there are others that I might have left out, but the most important component is the patient and the family. Um, and we look at them as partners, both in treatment and in research. In summary, um, National Ataxia Foundation and local support groups are critical to the treatment of ataxias. They empower patients and family members uh, because they provide knowledge, and knowledge is indeed power. It is important to recognize that ataxia is treatable no matter what kind of ataxia it is. It may not be fully curable, preventable, or reversible. We are on that path through research. Um, it is important to find neurologists knowledgeable about ataxia um, and ataxia centers so that you get multidisciplinary treatment, which, can, which, are, which are specialized and customized um, to uh, the patients and the family's needs. Um, last but not the least, participation in research is key to advancing treatments and discovering cures um, for the cerebellar ataxia. So kindly uh, partner with your treating neurologist um, and the National Ataxia Foundation to find a research trial um, that you can access. Um, with that, I conclude this presentation. I hope it was useful. Um, I thank you all very much, and I'll open it up to question and answers. Thank you.